I find that what always breeds hope is action. Climate rebels have wreaked havoc in the Sydney day today. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. I think as soon as you become aware and try to do something, you realise that's the only thing we can do. It is time to rebel. We openly challenge ourselves and our toxic system. Spring Rebellion is especially important in Australia because the current government is more interested in economic growth and opening up new coal mines than it is in the future and the protection of our planet. And I think that they don't seem to have listened to the scientists, to petitions, to marches in the past. So this is really the only way that they're going to listen. For your movement of uh, people who really care about climate change and getting stuff done. We want politicians, the media to tell the truth, act as though the truth is real and institute a citizens assembly to make the decisions about how we have a safe future. People, 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 power. I try to be part of every action. Um, so the first year there was a rally kind of march thing and it turned into a kind of roadblock with the Westies, which was really special because it was the kickoff of the rebellion week. quite stagnant and so I think it's important for this spring rebellion to happen to get Australia to be conscious and to have these sit-ins, have these disruptions, have this um, conversation started and pushed to the forefront because it's been pushed to the back quite heavily. We held an intersection uh, outside Treasury House for about three hours. We set up a big PA system, we had music, we had dancing in the rain, the atmosphere was just incredible.
around 60 people got arrested. Every time that they got arrested, there was singing, there was chanting. It was just this incredible, inclusive community environment that we were in. Uh, there's a lot of nervous people who organise that, wanting it to go well, and, uh, and it did go well. We sat in the middle of the intersection at Spring Street, and I was there for ages. I've done, I've been on the marches, I've, I've been vegetarian for a long time, I do my recycling, and all those things are just not working for us. And so I've really reluctantly come to the decision that we need to, to engage in mass civil disobedience. I'm an academic at a Melbourne University. I'm really frightened for my family and particularly for people already acutely affected by climate change. So for me it is to immediate action to mitigate the, the harms that are already being perpetrated and provide some kind of hope for future generations that there'll be a habitable earth. You can close your eyes for a march, you can ignore a petition, but if you cause disruption, if business as usual cannot just continue, if we feel it economically, but also just in the way we move around the city, you cannot ignore it. It's basically one of our yeah, last resorts we have. So I think engaging in these disruptive actions really is an attempt to try and force the issue and to get government to the table. So a lot of people within XR are, are coming to these protests because they feel the system has failed them. They feel the governments have failed to act on the climate crisis and in fact they're doing worse than not acting. We are facing a future that is too hot. We're facing civilizational collapse. We need to be taking drastic action because nobody is listening to us when we use conventional means. group of people either on bikes or walking block an intersection but it's very quick and then you move quickly on to another intersection. It's difficult for the police to crack down on that type of protest. It causes a lot of minor disruptions in different locations. There's a lot of exposure to, to different people. I feel like that's one of the best techniques that Extinction Rebellion is using. disobedience. Uh, I think that's the best thing we've done so far. It was basically like a revival of the flash mob with like hundreds of super happy dancing people on the streets uh, doing civil disobedience. Yeah, so yeah, generally it's just amazing.
kind of shows a different part of being a community. Like on the one side, it's all about disruption and being grieving together. But on the other side, it's also like building a community that is really strong and that can be a source of happiness for the whole world. And so many people dancing on the streets and doing like awkward moves on ah, 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 I'm staying alive. It's just, I don't know, like, I think it's really contagious. The response from the tram drivers, the response from people watching it was generally, wow, that looks like fun. And it's a way of building allies and ensuring that, yes, we're disrupting the city, but nothing is as important as this. And the creative expressions of our rebellion are ways of helping to overcome fear of being part of the rebellion and to hopefully invite you, whoever you are, to join us and enjoy it. two simultaneous blockades going on with people gluing themselves on the streets and even locking themselves into pipes. I was part of the organization and the like strategy and it was just really cool because everything was secret. I've been talking to people about what we're doing and why we're doing it, especially people who are disrupted in cars. So I explain you know, what our strategy is and I apologise for the short disruption that's occurring. I had mixed reactions. Some people are totally on board with what we're doing and are like, good for you, um, keep it up, really supportive and want to sign up to learn more. Other people are less enthusiastic about it, but that's just the nature of society and you're not always going to have everybody on your side, but we want to spread the message and to make sure that people understand the reasons that we're disrupting their day. And we found that generally that's had quite a positive response. It's impossible to have a sustainable system which has extreme levels of wealth inequality. And climate justice is creating a just system where everybody has a say in the future of um, our society. Always was, always will be. I think climate justice is firstly just recognising that the climate crisis is going to disproportionately affect people in the global south, First Nations people, people of colour all across the world. I'm from Malaysia. One of the worst case scenario predictions is that we'll see seven metres of sea level rise by the end of 
the century in Malaysia. That's most of the West Coast cities wiped out. <laughs> What we need to be doing is looking at how we can ensure that those who have been and benefited from, uh, particularly the oil companies, benefited from the um, emissions that we've seen to date, can ensure that those who have contributed least and benefited least have a safe and equitable future. Everything we need to achieve climate justice is here and I think a lot of it is about the distribution of our resources. Three pillars to a people's assembly. One is radical inclusivity, the other one is active listening, and the third is trust. Get rid of a system, but to uh, show a new one working. That are non-violent, but they're still disruptive. Make a broader, bring more people on board. The people's assemblies have been a really great space for people to discuss these issues like climate justice, things around the police and indigenous rights. Indigenous knowledges went far beyond hunting. Our knowledges were a core understanding of plants and animals, how our weather systems work, how the full ecosystem works as an ecology, one reliant on the other. You take one portion out, it doesn't work anymore. There was a very strong consensus coming out of all of them is that climate justice and Aboriginal sovereignty has to be central to the project of XR in terms of averting and addressing the climate crisis. Despite not being responsible for this catastrophe, First Nations people have been on the front lines fighting climate change since colonisation. This frontline activism it has been ongoing for First Nations people. It's been their reality since colonization.
There's all sorts of different local groups which all have been organising different actions all under kind of the banner of XR. A few of the actions we planned, we weren't sure if we were going to get numbers at them, but then people just come out from all across, you know, central Victoria, places like Gippsland and Kyneton and, you know, Warrnambool and Geelong. When I heard about the camp being planned and all the resources that were going into it, I had this, this feeling that maybe it was distracting from some of the actions in the city that we could be devoting our resources to, but having seen it now and been here, and I realised how important it is to have a base and, and a home that you can come back to after actions and use as a launching pad for actions. It's been an amazing environment here. There have been arts workshops, there's breakfast and lunch and dinners. The camp has kind of been an opportunity to bring together people who might otherwise not have a connection to each other. It's just such a wonderful community, it's such a wonderful culture of... I'm just constantly inspired and I wish everyone could enjoy this because it's just such a source of happiness. It's incredible, uh, it's just incredible. It's been one of the most, I joined only three months ago, met a whole bunch of people who've now become friends. It's been super nourishing, taking the week off work, spending your evenings in pubs or in community centres talking about things that matter. As a mum, I actually found it really emotionally confronting to be walking with such a powerful symbol of grief and mourning as the Red Brigade are, because to me it really is a symbol of the fact that we're in the sixth mass extinction. People enjoy having their sense of stimulators, so I think having beautiful flags and banners and art pieces and incredible folk walking around in red clothing brings the eye and helps the body remember. If we have more visual stimulus, we'll remember what's going on a little bit better as opposed to just stimulating, say, our audio side by hearing chants or whatnot. The oceans are rising. As the waves roll across the street, we invite you to lie down in a symbolic act of drowning.
And what I love so much about the movement is the culture and the creativity and that we do not only shout during protests but try to bring all the goodness that we have as people, um, like creativity, art, but also music and singing together into our actions. And I think this is really important because in a way this is a universal language and in Extinction Rebellion we need everyone. We've managed to shift the narrative with, with climate change and the climate crisis. We've managed to put Extinction Rebellion uh, into lounge rooms. We've managed to put it on people's newspapers every single day of the week. And that really creates a, a different kind of conversation. And part of civil dis disobedience is um, creating the space to create a dialogue that wasn't there previously. Everyone's talking about it as we've been walking around the city. Hear everyone talking about it back at work, people are talking about it as well, so the word's definitely, definitely getting out there. The mainstream media have been here every day, and in fact they've actually been trying to you know, do interviews with um, random communities, and what they've been finding is that actually a lot of people are very much in support of our protests. This week has been incredibly moving to see the amount of people that are joining together as a collective for such an important cause. Now I'm aware of the problem and I know that there is something you can do. It's almost a moral responsibility to get out of this mode of inaction. And like now I couldn't imagine prioritising anything else. I was arrested in Brisbane, I was arrested uh, outside Santos, the country's second largest oil and gas producer. Uh, I spent six hours in the watch house in Adelaide, uh, I was charged with the road obstruction. I did a lot of thinking, particularly after the last election and the return of the Scott Morrison government, about what kind of narrative I wanted to tell and what my story would mean and that's partly why I'm here. I hope that after this week there will be real change that happens and if not, Extinction Rebellion will make sure that it does eventually.